forgive me if my camera angle changes throughout this video. I had to get a new battery because this is going way longer than expected. So, picking up where we left off. Gabriella says I need help staying on top of planning and getting everything done with constant interruptions. For me, this is like another plug for batch lesson planning because it's just become such a process and a habit that if I'm stopped, I know where to pick up when I come back. But let's just talk about the interruptions for a minute. It can be really hard because we all have very different situations. I have my own classroom and that is like an ideal situation. And I know not every teacher has that luxury. Like if you're sharing a space with another teacher, it's really hard to set a boundary because you don't want to be rude and you don't want to create like attention that doesn't need to be there or anything like that. So I totally get that. As much as you can try to set boundaries around your time. So if you do have your own classroom, close the door. And if you need to, turn off the lights and maybe sit in a corner where you can't be seen from a window so that way you can work without people bothering you. My biggest thing that I like to do is actually just put on music in my um, AirPods. And this is like kind of a side conversation, but if I'm going to use music to work and kind of drown out distractions, I have to put on music that I'm familiar with. I cannot listen to, not that I listen to new music anyway at this point, but if I was trying to listen to like a new album, I would be so engrossed in hearing the new stuff that I wouldn't be able to focus on my work. But because I play the same old music over and over and over, I'm able to really focus. I guess my example would be podcasts. Certain podcasts are really great for background noise, like um, I listen to Out of the Pods, which is based on Love is Blind with Deep Tea and Natalie. That's something I can kind of listen to in the background because it's just like a conversation. It's not something really engrossing. But if I were to listen to, and I know not everyone can do that, but if I were to try listening to like an education book where I need to really focus and kind of like take notes, I would not be able to do like planning work at the same time. So just a couple of ideas. Another one is to try to change up your environment a little bit, like maybe get out of that classroom. If you know your distractions are just stemming from you have to share a space, maybe go to the library where if you're working, maybe people are going to see you working, but I don't know. There's just something about a library where we have different standards or try to find, um, if you have a like-minded colleague that has the same planning time as you, where they also would like to sit down and do work, maybe try to visit with them during that time so you could both focus and not be distracted. Robbie asks, how would you specifically use interactive notebooks with foreign language classes? Do you have a concrete setup or do you flex it depending on subject matter? I would have to say it's got to be flexible based on your subject matter because I, I just teach math and I've only ever taught math, so I don't have any like really specific examples for using an interactive notebook with a foreign language class. But I'm thinking of it kind of like, would it be like a glossary if you were to do it that way? I'm not really sure, to be honest. And I don't, like I'm not familiar with how foreign language curriculum is set up. Like for math, it's very much like you have a unit. So um, everything within that unit is gonna be like in this section and then you'll start a new section when you start your next unit. You could do it that way, or maybe you don't split it up, but you have extra pages left over for your table of contents. So, you know, maybe you take four pages or so for students to be able to fill in the table of contents as the year goes, and you don't separate it. I really honestly don't know, because I'm just, you know, stuck in math thinking. But interactive notebooks can be used for any subject. Um, we might have to do like a little Google search on foreign language teachers using interactive notebooks to see what you can do there. Amy asks, how do you keep your class focused when there is one student or a small group who insists on either being disruptive or just not participating? I would also love an answer to that question. Um, this is another spot where I'm kind of, I don't have a ton of experience or solutions for this. And I wouldn't say I don't have experience with it, I think we all experience it, but it's very different with 
the classes that I teach like the calculus class the geometry class that's on level they're in like a higher level math so they want to do well so they might get disruptive in that way but I can bring them back in because I'm like hey you know you have a final coming up or hey this is a college class or hey you have you know the state exam and their their new term is lock in they'll say I'm locked in and it's some kind of a slang term but they understand it so it's something that I can use with them like oh it's time to lock in and I don't know it's something that they're into so we will like lock in and then they're pretty good about that but with the seventh graders it's a very different thing because their state exam is pretty much inconsequential and it happens in the spring instead of at the end of the school year so it is really just a different animal with them plus the age level and maturity level come into play there so me being like okay it's time to lock in with seventh graders does not have the same effect at all i try to give them a little bit of positive attention before they start getting really disruptive that can help curb their like urge to get that attention um, when they have a little bit of positive attention beforehand but it's not foolproof and it doesn't work for everyone so i don't know that i really have a concrete solution for you pardon the interruption but there were two things i forgot about when i was answering this question and now that i'm editing i can't not add them in so um the first thing was we talked about um, telling my students to lock in and I never explained what it meant but for us old people it's buckling down like just getting focused and staying focused the other thing was what I commonly do with my students if I have one student that's kind of like trying to drive the class off task is I will actually engage with them and like head off on their tangent with them so that I can kind of get everyone on the same page even if it's not the content that we're doing so that I can then lead them back to what we are supposed to be doing. So sometimes it's like a minute or two of me asking a question about whatever crazy thing that they're saying, and usually it's not that bad. So it's usually something that we can just have a quick conversation about, or um, I'll share my opinion on whatever it is that they're talking about, and then I'll say, okay, and we'll hear from other people, and then I'll say, okay, let's go back to the math, and then if they try to do it again, I'll say, that's interesting. Why don't we have a conversation about that after we finish this problem? So that way they know that, that they can still be heard. Usually these behaviors are just attention seeking and these students wanting attention. So giving it to them in little doses helps to kind of curb them completely derailing your class. So Deb says, that she needs help with organizing grades now this one's a little bit different because this is a homeschool teacher that does all grades all subjects so what i use to organize my grades actually now i'm thinking you probably don't have access to like an online grade manager or like our attendance manager is our grade manager if that makes sense in a school i would be setting up a google spreadsheet for this just to keep track of everything um, and have it calculate out the averages for you where across the top you would have the assignments listed out and then down the left hand column your students um, and then you put the, the grades into the field and then you have a column on the right hand side that would be averaging or tallying totaling however you want to say it their grades um, and then I would make a separate sheet for each subject area um, possibly for the different grade levels. I mean, it really depends on how many students you have and what exactly they're all doing. I mean, that could be a lot of spreadsheets. That might be a little bit too much. Generally, what I do paper-wise, though, is I keep track of most grades on a attendance sheet. So I'll have, like, my roster printed out with spaces for 10, 10 days. So it covers, like, two weeks of instruction, and I'll put the date across the top and then if we have an assignment that day I will write in what the assignment is. I actually have a video where I created this and it's a free template you can grab from that video so I will have that linked below but if you have like one student that's in one grade level it could get to be a lot so I don't know that I have a succinct way to put it all together into one spot. You might have multiple pages and multiple ways to track 
um, trying to think outside of the box here. Maybe you have a template that is like one page per student, but it has their grades for all the subjects. So maybe take the idea of having their assignments written out across the top and then have a spot for their grade to go, but repeat that multiple times for the different subjects. It's really hard to answer some of these questions when it's not something that I personally experienced, but I do my best. I mean, on the one hand, I kind of want to say, tell me what you need and I'll try to make it into a template for you. But then I'm also worried that even if I do that, it might not actually help because I have no foundational understanding of what you have to do for homeschool. That's one of those things where every now and then I'd say it'd be nice to homeschool my kids so I could be with them. But at the same time, like I think about it a little bit more and I'm like, I don't think I could really handle that either. So Liz asked for a fast way to generate report card comments. This is something I might look into with the help of AI, but generally speaking, I kind of have a couple of go-tos. So when students are doing well, my go-to is shows good effort, and that's why they're doing well, it's because they are putting forth the effort, and a pleasure to have in class, which not my favorite report card comment. It doesn't really say much, kind of just implies that they are obedient. Um, but you know what? It is true. I do enjoy having these kids in my class. Um, it's also sometimes kind of hard to include positive comments when you only get three and sometimes you really have a lot to tell the parent about how the child is doing in your class. And for some parents, it's hard to reach them. And this is, I feel like a lot of times this is the only place to really do it. Um, but my go-tos are telling the parent like student is missing X amount of classwork and or homework assignments because that plays a part in them being able to do well in the assessments. Um, a, one that I go to a lot is students fail test did not make corrections, which is a fr frustrating one because they could have been doing better if they had put forth a little bit of effort. Um, our school is also, they're starting to guide us through putting comments that are more like directional, like giving parents and students an idea of how to improve. So one of the ones that is in our common bank is needs to study for exams. Another one I've been using a lot is extra help is available. So just letting them know they can come in for extra help. Sometimes I'm more specific than that. It depends on the classes because certain classes I have lunch the same time that they do. So I'll say extra help is available during lunch because unfortunately with my crazy family schedule. I cannot stay after school anymore. I mean, I'm there for a little bit and I tell students that like, you can pop in and get quick help, but you have to go to like your actual activity because they have to sign up. Everyone has to be accounted for in our school for the after school activities that we have. After the second marking period, we have four quarters in our school, but after the second marking period, if a student if their first and second quarter average is failing, I will start telling the parent and the student, you need to get X grade or more um, as an average in the remaining quarters and possibly on the final, if that applies to the course, to pass. So the, the comment sounds like, for example, needs to earn 75 plus average on third and fourth marking period and final to pass course or something like that. I mean, we just finished the third quarter, so it was a lot of needs, 75 plus, a fourth quarter average to pass course, um, you know, or the final, if that's part of the, the grade for the overall course. So those are my go-to comments. We do have a comment bank, like I mentioned, which is very helpful. We're able to edit those comments that are in the bank, which is really great, so I could expand on them or not. And recently they actually made it so that when we do add our own comments, we have a lot more space. It used to be like a max of like 50 characters or something like that. Now it's like 250. So we're able to get a lot more out and I try to squeeze in extra comments sometimes that way. Carmen asks how to differentiate homework and class activities for weaker learners in the class in a fun way. I think this is going to sound bad, but I don't exactly prioritize a fun in my math classes. I welcome it and I would love to have more of it, but sometimes like, I don't know, I feel like that pressure of this exam that 
I'm being held accountable for and we got to get through all these things which is really unfortunate because I feel like it actually impedes learning overall but there's only so much I can do um differentiating for me is more on the spot with students getting to work with them one-on-one -on -one as much as possible throughout the classes that's my main focus when I'm trying to differentiate um we were given a lot of like focus I feel like in college on pre-assessing students and finding where their weaknesses are before you start your unit and that way you can address it throughout and I feel like I don't know it's just I feel like it's not practical uh, anytime I've ever given my students a pre-assessment it really stressed them out because they're like I don't know how to do this so what I try to focus on instead is in our daily warm-ups if there is prerequisite knowledge that students need for that subject, I will try to go over it in the warm up and use that as a way to assess how students are with the skill that they need to have beforehand and how much we need to like reteach and practice that skill. I feel like for a lot of math classes, trying to make things fun is really just kind of come down to gamification and gamification is a way to engage students but on the flip side I feel like it can be kind of harmful and it just depends I'm not saying this is like a sweeping generalization for anyone or everyone and you always do whatever works best for you in your classroom but when I think of gamification I think of like Kahoot for example I will use it sparingly because it's just something different because I don't use it very often that it does get students interested um, my seventh graders when I used it with them recently they really really liked it but the problem that I have with Kahoot is the point system and the rewards are based on speed and math should not be based on speed. I mean, if it's like a simple recall question, like a math vocabulary, that would be one thing. But a lot of students' math anxiety came from those drills where you have a minute to figure out your multiplication table or to answer, you know, these 100 questions of like mental math. And I don't want to continue that cycle of timing students. And that's kind of what a lot of the gamification comes down to is who can get it the fastest. Um, so if you can find a way to incorporate a game where it's not about the speed, but about learning and I don't know, even if it's spinning it on its head, like what's the best mistake we can learn from on this problem or something like that, I feel like that is wonderful. If you can turn that into a game, I'm just not into the things being timed and who can do it the fastest. Um, so I've kind of kind of pushed away from like, let's make everything fun, personally. Not saying it's wrong to make things fun. I think it's great if you can. Um, in my school, we're doing a professional learning community book club and we're reading engaging students with poverty in mind and I anticipate I might have a better answer to this question in the future and our last question comes from Dan I love this question I probably will still do like an email specifically for this question but he asks how do we include planning for students that are chronically absent or miss key instructional days so my answer to this question has really evolved since 2020 and the pandemic we have a Google Classroom for all of our classes now and it's kind of like just in case we ever have to go back but now it's just become part of what we do and we're all used to it. It's just a really great communication tool and I I really like working with Google I really like working with Google Classroom as a tool for organizing everything that we've done in class plus you know parents can see it so that's all great. But what I've done since 2020 was record video lessons because you know, at one point we were asynchronous and then we were synchronous, but students are absent all the time and there was a lot going on. So I went and recorded a lot of video lessons. Um, now I need to go back and record some. I need to fill in where some are missing. Um, I kind of want to do a separate set of videos for my lower level geometry class because I never did one specifically for them. I gave them the geometry ones. Um, and then as far as calculus and pre-calculus goes, I had a curriculum I purchased from TPT and I used the videos that came with that. And I use videos that I found on YouTube. But having videos, whether you make them or not, and having a place where students can access them 
has been just super beneficial for those students that are absent because then they don't feel like I missed this and now I can't learn this. So that is like the one big component. But as far as the paperwork goes, I have folders in my classroom that I put up on the wall so students can like visually see them. And when they are absent, they get their papers from there. I include a form and I don't do this all the time now. I used to do this every single day and it just got to be too much. So if a student's missed like a single piece of paper, I just put their name on it and put it in the folder. But if there were multiple pages or there's now an assignment due, I fill out a little form and I have it available. I believe it's free in my TPT shop. So I will link that below. But it just tells them like you missed X, Y, and Z today. This is what you're responsible for turning in. This is when it's due. And it also communicates if they missed a quiz or a test to make up. That was a lot of questions. I hope it was helpful. And I'm sorry for the questions that I was not able to answer due to my lack of experience. But the great news is that there's lots of other teachers out there on the internet that may have had the same experience as you and they could give you a much better answer. So that'll be it for this video. Make sure you check out the links below. And as always, thanks for watching.